hello? <laughs> Not working? Is that good? Okay, okay. <laughs> All right. This whole morning's been filled with technical difficulties, but it's also been filled with the presence of God. And that's what counts the most. So God's a good God, and we're going to continue on with what he wants to do. Lord, we just thank you for this service. We thank you for those joining us online. We ask that you would continue to pour your Holy Spirit into each one of us. Continue to open up our spiritual eyes, ears, and hearts and speak to us. We ask that you continue to bring your manifest presence in our lives and change us from glory to glory. We honor you, we thank you, we praise you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, we, we mentioned last week, and, and we're going to mention again, um, coming up on Wednesday nights, starting September 15th and 17th, we're going to be going over this book written by Jack Hayford called Rebuilding the Real You. And I don't know if you can get it up on the screen, um, but... One of the things you need to do is print out this study guide. Okay, so if you go to jackhafer.org and then type in Rebuilding the Real You, you'll come to this page. So what you'll have to do, if you've ordered your book or whatever, if you want to participate, whether you're going to join Zoom or not, I encourage you to do it on your own. Um, but you, you need to order the book if you ordered it already and I have it for you please see me afterwards and um, give me the $15 I'll give you the book you know you have it if you want one that you didn't raise your hand come and talk to me or you can order your book on your own that's fine but um, order the book but everyone will need to print this out on your own so you go to here put in rebuilding the real you click on that the top one is the study guide and right down here it says download free study guide. So click on that. So you'll do this at home. And then it's 36 pages. So it's not that much. You print that out. If you're a husband and wife doing it, you'll need to print two of them out because it's going to be personal questions for you that you're going to fill out that's going to help you through the series. So um, that's all you have to do. Print that out. You'll have the book, you'll have the study guide, and again, we're going to start that um, September 15th. It'll be on Zoom. Those who are online and want to join, you are more than welcome to join. All we need is your email address. Email it to cffc.lasalle, L-A-S-A-L-L-E, -L -L -E, at gmail.com, and um, I'll send you all a, a Zoom invitation once the week of September 15th, it's going to go through November 17th. And it's going to be a little different than what we're used to. Uh, it's not going to be somebody just preaching, but it's going to be all of us interacting of what God's doing and speaking to us. And, and that's the goal, is, is changing our life. And we're going to talk a little bit about that um, during this, this lesson. Um, but for now... Uh, these are just some practical things that we need to do to get started. So you can go ahead and take that down, and uh, God bless you. Last week, we, we talked about planting good seeds in your life, that our responsibility is planting seed and watering it, but God is the one that makes it grow. God's, the good seed is God's word, his, his, anything of his Holy Spirit, Anything of God is, is good seed. And asking the question, what are we planting in our lives, right? The seed is the initial consumption, receiving, the inputting, the planting in our life. If you see something for the first time, or you hear something for the first time, you read something, uh, a thought, good or bad, an action, good or bad, seeds are always daily coming into our lives. And we can control the amount of good seed versus the bad seed that we receive to a degree. Now, sometimes we know something pops up or somebody says something or does something. You know, we can't control that. But for the most, we can control what we're watching, right? 
We can control who we're talking with. We can control the environment we're in. We can control what's coming into us. Now the seed will die without proper sunlight and water, and we want the bad seed in our life to die, but we want the good seed to grow. So we need to stop watering the bad seeds in our life, right? Sometimes we're like doing the same thing over and over, and we're like, why does this keep happening? Well, what are we watering? And we need to revisit that in our lives. But start by planting good seeds continually. Ecclesiastes encourages us, do it in the morning. Plant seed in the morning. Plant seed at night. Plant seed continually because you don't know what's going to stick or not. We need to begin with the Word of God. The Bible is so vital, so important. This is the living Word of God. This is the powerful Word of God that changes our life. Without this, then no seed will, will um, produce any good fruit. We need to water it by, by asking God for understanding as we read it and by living it out, remembering that God will make it grow in our lives. The seed, the, uh, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These things that we need to have in our life, right? That God will help us live these things out as we begin to put those into practice, watering those seeds, right? We can all look at that list and say, man, there's some areas that I can work on, right? Do I love as Jesus loved? Or am I just loving as the world loves? Because there's a big difference. <laughs> am I walking in peace not just peace some of the time, but I mean fully, no matter what happens in my life, I have a confidence and I have a peace that I know God's in control. Or sometimes do I get a little anxiety and a little fear, right? Those are areas we can work on. Am I walking in the joy of the Lord? Am I being patient all the time? Or does something set me off, right? All of these things we can work on. There's things that we can work on, and we water that by putting it into practice and asking the Holy Spirit to help us. And we need to spend some time with the Son, S-O-N, Jesus Christ, to bring the sunlight. One of Jesus' name is the bright morning star, that, that we get the sunlight that a seed needs through his word, through time in prayer, through time in fasting, through time in giving thanks to God, Give, giving Giving financially, giving of ourselves, giving of time, worship and praise, listening to God, not just talking to him, but listening to what he has to say. Just spending time with Jesus brings that sunlight to help the seeds grow. And then the rains that we need from the Holy Spirit. Deuteronomy 11 encouraged us that the rains come to water the seeds in our lives through faithful obedience to God's commands. That we, we need to be obedient to what God is telling us to do. We need to be obedient to the two greatest commandments, Jesus said. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourselves. If we do good on those two things, we're going to do good with the rest that's in the Bible. Remember that God alone makes the seeds grow. It's a mystery how he can do it. But we are responsible for planting good seeds in our lives, in others' lives, and for watering them. But God in his infinite power and wisdom will make it grow in our lives. Jesus encouraged us in Mark 4.20 that others like seeds sown on good soil. The soil is your heart. The soil is your soul, your mind, your body. What are the things that you're planting in? Is it good soil to receive those things? Ask God to make your soil good. And they hear the word of God. Again, if we're not hearing this, there's no seed. <laughs> there's no seed to grow. We have to be in the word of God. And they accept it, meaning they say, this is the word of God. This is God's word. This is what I live my life according to. And then we produce a crop. We put the effort in to live according to his word. We do those things, then Jesus has the miraculous power to produce a crop of 30, 60, or even 100 times what was sown. It's the, the things that God wants to change in our lives, getting out the weeds and the thorns and putting in the good things. You, think about your life right now. You are the way you are because of seeds planted years ago, right? 
and what has been watered in your life. So the way that you think, the way that you act, the way that you are is because seeds in your life, good and bad. And if we're honest with each other, all of us have some of the weeds and the thorns that go in there. And weeds don't play nice, right? Weeds don't just go off in a little corner by themselves. No, they get right in there with the good stuff, right? And they start choking it out, right? And that's exactly what those bad seeds that we planted in our lives, that to be honest, sometimes we don't even think about anymore. But they're dug deep in there and they affect every part of our life and not for the good. And then there's things that are in there that really do affect us for the good. And we need to get to that place where we're, we're, we're realizing the things that we've, we just do on a natural basis that aren't of God. And we need to make the changes of pulling those things out and making sure we're planting good things in our lives. Because I don't know about you, but I don't want to be the same that I am today that I'm going to be next year and the year after that and five years from now and so forth. I, I want to change. But it doesn't just happen overnight. And it doesn't just happen by just saying a prayer. That's part of it. But we put some work into it. God was confirming what, what he's wanting to do in our lives to me this week by leading me to this book by um, Chuck Swindoll or Charles Swindoll um, called Living Above the Level of Mediocrity. A commitment to excellence. And I almost finished the book this week. I got pretty close, but didn't quite finish it. But here were some things that the Lord was showing me. And it was just amazing. Towards the beginning of this book, Chuck Swindoll was talking about um, renewing our mind and, and renewing our soul and, and all those things and talking about the watering of the seeds and the planting of the seeds and talking about rebuilding of the walls like we're going to be doing here. And, and I'm like, oh my goodness, Lord, no wonder you directed me to this book. You're just confirming what you want to do in our lives during this season. And he says... Walls in the ancient Near East were used to protect not only cities, but vineyards and gardens as well. Proverbs 24, verses 30 to 34, describes the condition of one such vineyard. I passed by the field of the sluggard and by the vineyard of the man lacking sense, and behold, it was completely overgrown with thistles. Its surface was covered with needles, and its stone wall was broken down that wall to protect that garden. When I saw, I reflected upon it. I looked and received instruction, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Then poverty will come on as a robber and your, your want like an armed man. What kind of shape is your mental vineyard in? Are there cracks in the walls where nocturnal rodents sneak in to steal away your fruit? Do you run off invading a thoughts with a tenacious hoe, or are you a mental sluggard, laying back in your hammock, catching 40 winks? If the latter, don't be surprised to wake up one day and find your moral garden full of weeds. Let's be honest. The, the things that we have planted in our lives, whether from us or from other people, but that we've allowed to stay there, that alter the way we think and the way we talk, the way we act, the way we handle situations, all those kind of things that make up who we are. We, as, as, as good gardeners of the, our souls, we need to get down and dirty and start pulling out those weeds, right? All the bad stuff. Well, that's just the way I am. Let's be honest, when, the more older we get, the less we want to change. It, am I the only one? <laughs> or is that truth? We don't want to change, but could you imagine Moses saying to God, God, you know, you used me powerfully to help deliver the people from, from Egypt and all these things and stuff like that. I, I'm, I'm older now. I, I, I need to retire. 
I was talking to someone this week. Uh, 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 somebody had mentioned to me, retirement, the word retirement is not in the Bible. <laughs> it doesn't mean that you, you don't have to retire from work. Understand that. But we don't retire from God's kingdom and the work of God for his kingdom. Remember the apostle Paul? He's like, man, there was one point. It was like he was debating. He's like, man, I've, I've, I've lived a long life. I've done so much for God. He's like, I'm kind of at that place where I'm like, it's better for me to go home and be with God. He's like, but you know what? It's better for you if I stay and keep ministering, even at an old age, even when I'm tired and weak and I've been beaten and I'm broken and everything like that, I'm going to keep being ministered um, to you through God. We need to remember that God is not done with us. Until you're six feet under, God is still working on you. The Bible says you go from glory to glory. We have to get out of the mindset that we, we want to live in mediocrity. We have to get out of the mindset that we're fine with the status quo. We have to get out of the, the American church that says it's good enough just to come on a Sunday and Wednesday night. It's good enough just to throw in 10% of my offering. It's good enough to go through the motions of a Christian when God is calling us deeper into him. God is saying, I have more for you, child. If you just come to me, I have more to pour out. I have more to deliver you from. I have more truth to pour into you. You, can't, you don't even understand a, a fraction of this word of God. I have more to reveal to you. I got more for your life. But we, as a, as a natural garden, like we said last week, we don't just go pray over our garden and expect things to just happen. We pray over our garden of our life, but we have to get down and dirty. We have to put the work in. God is calling us to not be spoon-fed anymore. It's easy to show up to church and have the pastor preach at us. It's much harder to get alone with God and do the work that he's called us to do. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 5, he says, Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. We can't live on milk and being spoon-fed. We have to put the work into constant use. And that's what the season God is calling us as a church and as individuals and saying, there's stuff I want to do in you, but you got to put work into it. I'll do my part. But you got to do your part. We can't just show up to church and ask for God to do it. That's part of it. But then we got to do the work. And God is giving us tools. Charles Swindoll and Jack Hayford are two men that are way smarter than I am and are used by God in powerful ways. And God has given them wisdom to help us rebuild that garden and the vineyards inside of us and to rebuild the wall to protect it. Because... I don't know about you, but I'm sick and tired of having a good day and then another day, temptation comes in, Satan comes in, my sinful nature comes in, lies come in, and I fall flat on my face. I'm tired of it. I want to live above that. I want to live in freedom. I want to live in truth, the truth of God's word, not my own truth. I want to live in victory and in hope and in joy and in peace. I want to live in love. I want, to, I want to see you as Christ sees you. And I want to pour into you the good seeds of him. I don't want to live selfishly. But it all starts with rebuilding and restoring my garden and rebuilding the wall to keep the thoughts. Jesus, the Bible says, make every thought obedient to Christ Jesus. Can we honestly say that every day, every moment, every thought is of Jesus Christ? I can't say that. But I'm working towards it. I'm working towards it, and God's going to help me the more that he builds that up. But i got to put the work in. I can't be spoon-fed. We need to get God's vision for our life, because his vision is greater than our vision. 
I'm going to read a little bit of what Chuck Swindoll said. He says, vision, the ability to see God's presence, power, and plan in spite of the obstacles. So think about that for your life, okay? Your life. What is the vision for your life? Vision is the ability to see God's presence, power, and plan in spite of the obstacles. Let's be honest. There's going to be obstacles. <laughs> Satan is not going to be, be happy that we're doing a work in restoring our lives, right? Gaining back the ground that he's snuck his little weaselly fingers into. You know, in the book of Nehemiah that this book talks about, you know, um, there was opposition, constant opposition to the rebuilding of the wall. But they pressed through. They kept going. And they kept their eyes on the Lord. And God got them the victory. He gives an example of vision. An American visiting in France came upon a scene where a large church was being erected. He approached three stone workers, one after the other. Of each, he asked this question, what are you doing? The first said, I'm cutting stone. The second said, I'm cutting stone for seven francs a day. And the third responded, I'm helping to build a great cathedral. Can you see cathedrals and the challenges God has set before you or just a lot of rough stones? Faith sees the cathedrals. Sight sees the stones. Whatever God is working in you, it's like we have those three responses, right? It's either we're, we're just getting up every day going, man, just another day. <laughs> I just got to get through this day and whatever's in front of me. And, you know, in the back of my, our minds, we're just thinking it's useless, right? It's just, just tedious work. Tedious over and over, doing the same thing. And then there's the second one who's a little bit better, saying, yeah, I'm doing this work, but at least I'm getting paid. At least I'm getting something out of it. <laughs> Having the mindset like, yeah, I'm doing stuff, but I'm getting a little reward out of this. But then the third one says, man, I'm part of something greater. I'm doing a, a small piece, but it's an important piece for the overall building of the cathedral. And that's the attitude and the mindset we need to see with the vision for your life. Whatever God puts in you, it may seem small and insignificant to you, but it's not to God. Because if it's not done, the whole thing is not done. If your part isn't done, what God is doing in this church and what God is doing in the Illinois Valley, what God is doing in your life, wherever you're at, and, and the people you're influencing, we need to get the vision that what I'm doing matters to God. What I'm doing has value and importance. And we need to realize and take a step back and say, every day of what I'm doing is for a greater good. And we get that vision inside of us. And we say, man, this is going to be an amazing day. Because God's doing a work in me. And it, I may not see all the results now, but I know God's doing a work in all my brothers and sisters. And God's going to do something great. This great cathedral he's going to build. We need to take time to dream. God-given dreams. He goes on to share. He says, most of us don't dream enough. We just don't take the time. What if someone were to ask you, what are your dreams for this year? What are your hopes, your agenda items? What are you trusting God for? Can you give a specific answer? Before responding, remember to look beyond your personal goals and objectives and think about your God-given dreams. It's okay to dream, right? It, it, if we are just stuck in, in a stone in front of us, just doing our, our daily routine, without having a dream and a vision, it does become boring and monotonous. Our lives become blah, <laughs> right? But if we realize, you know what? There's something bigger that God's doing and we begin to pray and say, God, 
give me your dreams and begin to talk to the Lord and saying, God, these are the things I want to see. We're in uh, end of August, right? End of August. Think about this year through December, right? If, if you're going to do this on your own or, or join the Zoom, think about what you want to see God do in your life. Think about after that comes Thanksgiving and Christmas. Think about what you want to see God do in your life, how you might want to help people during that season, during that time, whatever. But be, be dreaming, dreaming about what God wants for you. Then you have hope. Then you have encouragement. Then you have something to look forward to. Then your life doesn't just wake up and it's like, oh, cutting stone again, doing my normal things. But it's no, this day has a purpose because it's getting me somewhere at the end and it's getting all of us somewhere at the end. But we need to be careful we dream God's dreams. A surrendered will will not lead to heartache. Talking about God's kingdom, it says it asks for a surrendered will, an acknowledgement of God's authority over every area of our lives. Is the theme song of your life, have thine own way, Lord? Is his purpose your purpose? Is his will your will? If not, Jesus is waiting for you to descend your heart's throne and let him be king and make the glories of his kingdom a reality in your life. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid, and from joy over it he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field, Matthew 13, 44. We need to surrender our dreams and our will unto his. Otherwise it leads to heartache, because God's, loves you enough not to fulfill just what you want to do in your life. And people say, well, doesn't the Bible say um, he will give you the desires of your heart? No. The Bible doesn't say that. It says in Psalm 37, 4, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. We like to skip that first part and just say, God, you're going to give me the desires of my heart. So this is what I want to see happen by the end of this year. Ba 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 ba. And then we're disappointed when it doesn't work out that way. Taking delight in the Lord means you have a relationship with God where you're saying, God, I want everything of you to be inside of me. I want everything that you want inside of me. I want to be transformed by you. I want to be renewed by you. I want to know your word and the truth of it. I want to walk as Jesus walked. I want to be filled with your spirit. I want every desire of me to be your desires. And as we take that delight in walking daily with God, getting his heart, getting his mind, because we're spending time with him, then yes, he's going to fulfill every single one of your desires because they're going to be conformed to his desires for your life. Because Jeremiah 29, 11, God says, For I know the plans I have for you, plans of good and not of evil, plans of a hope and a future, that God has the best plans for you. Do you honestly believe that? Because too many times I battle with God, I want what I want. And God says, that's great, son, but that's not what's best. Are you willing to surrender to my will? Because every time you do that, it will never lead to heartache because God will fulfill every desire as you delight yourself in the Lord. Jesus gives us the example of saying, God, your will, not my will. Jesus did not come to dazzle us with his power nor to manipulate people or make himself a name. He didn't come to manufacture success. He came to seek and to save the lost. He came to give up his rights so that the Father's will would be done. Luke twenty two forty two. Jesus' image shines before our eyes. Are you mirroring his example? Or are you reflecting, maybe in whispered defiance, your own self-will? 
Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us and offering a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Ephesians 5, 1 through 2. Jesus gave the example of saying, not my will, Father, but yours be done. And that's the example we need to lead in our life of saying, God, I surrender my will unto yours. Yours be done, not mine. Jesus was the, the perfect example, but there's other examples too. And Zacchaeus, he wrestled with the kingdom, but when he came face to face with, this, his, um, with his kind opponent, the Lord Jesus, he surrendered on the mat. It was Jesus who won the match, but it was Zacchaeus who took home the trophy. Are you saved but still struggling on the mat? Sweating and grunting, trying to avert Jesus' authority with quick, cunning moves? The king will never pin you. But as long as you refuse to forfeit the match against his, the kingdom, your trophy will be an inner thirst that even Gatorade cannot quench. Is there something in your life you are wrestling with God about? <laughs> right? That happens, right? We're all human. We, we, we all have the two-year-old, mine, mine, mine. And the parent's like, no, nope, give that to me. No, nope, no, nope, mine, 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 right? We, we all struggle with that at some point in our lives. Where God is trying to do a work. Maybe, maybe it's this, this thing. Again, it's work. We're not sugarcoating it. If you want to be changed, you've got to put the work into it. Maybe God is calling you to do that, and you're fighting with it and saying, I don't want to do that. I'm comfortable. <laughs> I'm happy where I'm at. I, don't want, I want to be spoon-fed. Maybe it's something, a hope or a dream that you have in your life that you're just holding on to and saying, God bless it, God bless it, God bless it, God bless it. And he's saying, I can't bless it because I don't want that for your life. Right. Remember Jacob wrestling with the Lord all through the night? Why didn't he give up and surrender to him? Because all his life, his name meant deceiver, heel catcher, that he wanted to get what he wants, whether it meant deceiving people or not, whether it was the fair way or the right way, he wanted to get what he wanted in life. Instead of surrendering to God's will, and doing it God's way, doing it the right way. And he wrestled, and he wrestled, and he wrestled. And you know what God did? He touched his hip because he wouldn't forfeit the match. And he knocked his hip out of joint. For the rest of his life, Jacob, whose God changed his name to Israel, had to walk with the limp. Had to walk with the limp. Why do you think God did that? I think it's to remind Jacob that you're not in control. That I am God and I have all power and authority and I have the perfect plan and will for your life. And it wasn't just affecting his life. It was affecting a nation to be born. It was affecting a savior to be born. There was more than Jacob knew in his life. But he was not willing to let go and surrender. He wrestled and wrestled till finally God said, no. I'm going to do it my way, and you're going to be reminded every day of your life that I'm in control and you're not. And don't think that God, who's the same to yesterday, today, and forever, won't do that in your life because he loves you. If you're not willing to let go your hopes and dreams and what you want, you better believe God will touch something in your life. Remember the Apostle Paul? He said, man, I was getting prideful. God was using me in crazy ways. God was just doing amazing things. I got pride, and God gave a thorn in his flesh. We don't know exactly what that was, but we know that Paul pleaded three times, God, take this away from me. 
And God said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Why did God not take it away? Because it's a reminder to Paul, don't have pride. I'm using you because I am God and I chose to use you. You surrender to me. You be obedient to me. You do what I tell you to do. It's not in your power, Paul. It's not in your righteousness, Paul. It's not because you've been a Christian for 40 years, Paul. It's because I'm God and I choose to use you. And we need to humble ourselves and we need to let go of wrestling with God with what we want and say, God, my life is yours. I surrender on the mat. Pin me because he won't do it. He's a gentleman. He gives you free will. He will not do it, but he will give you a reminder for the rest of your life. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to go down that path. I don't want to limp the rest of my life because I was unwilling to give up. God's will for my will. Let go and surrender or you'll be frustrated and never satisfied. Making changes in your life takes making changes in your life. (laughs) Let me say that again. Making changes in your life takes making changes in your life. You can't just hope to make changes in your life. Again, you can't just pray about making changes. Please do pray, because that's part of it. But we have to do actions of actually changing things in order for things to change. God is calling us, guys. I just feel it in my spirit. And and he's working on me. (laughs) Probably more than anybody here. Saying, Nathan, you've got to change. I'm giving you tools to help you but you got to get your garden right and you got to get your walls built up because you won't be able to stand what's coming next unless you're right with me. This was uh, talking about the parable in Luke 5 and verses 37 to 39. It says, And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled out, and the skins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And no one, after drinking the old wine, wishes for new, for he says the old is good enough. Charles Swindoll says about that, um, what Jesus spoke about. He says, two significant applications jump out of the parable and hurdle the centuries. First, our God is a God of freshness and change. Yet he himself doesn't change, Hebrews 13, 8. His character is fixed, but his action is fluid like a river flowing from a rock. The message doesn't change. God doesn't change. But the way he does things changes. And we need to remember not to be stagnant, but the river winds and it flows. And sometimes it creates a new path. He says the second significant fact emerging from Luke 5 is new wineskins are essential, not optional. Every generation has been tempted to restrict God's dealings. Most people are maintainers, not innovators. That's why traditionalism appeals to the majority. But in each age, new things are wrought by God. And if we're going to accommodate the new, fresh workings of God, then new wineskins are essential. I love the founder of the Foursquare, the Amy Simple McPherson. She was so creative in getting the gospel message out. She didn't change the word of God, but she realized her time and where she's at and thought of different ways to get that out there. There's times that she would go to have a tent meeting in a a new area. She's like, how am I going to get people to fill the tent? She's like, she'd stand on the street corner and just like pose. (laughs) And people would stop. And and they're like, what in the world? What is this woman doing? And she'd just stay there until enough people gathered. And then she would stop and say, okay, let's go into this tent. And they'd be like, okay. And they just, (laughs) like she followed her in there. She would have services at a drive-in theater because she said some people won't go into church for whatever reason. 
but they still need to hear the gospel. So I'm going to do something creative to give the message correctly, but do it in a new venue, right? She created a, a, um, a Bible school to help train ministers, but she created a, a radio station. Because again, she's like, some people, I can't get into my church, but if I can get the message through the radio waves, the seed's being planted. We need to get out of the box of, of the four walls of this church and think, what are ways we can reach? Be praying that God gives you wisdom. What are ways you could reach your neighborhoods? What are ways you could reach this area for Jesus Christ? It says, is your wine still fresh? Or are you living on experiences from a generation ago? Are you tapping into new, bubbling, sparkling wine? Or has your faith grown flat and tasteless, lost its effervescence? And how about the wineskin? Are you still flexible? Or have traditionalism given your life a rigid, brittle texture? How open are you to change? How willing are you to risk? How quickly will you strike out in response to a new direction from God? We can't get comfortable in what God has done in the past. He is doing a new thing. The message doesn't change, but the venues might. If God's putting on your heart, I remember we had uh, what was called, like, back in, in um, decades ago, tell around at our church. And back then, kids would be all out in the parks playing, right? And we would go around and pass out flyers in the neighborhood and invite kids and all that stuff, and they would come in and, and they would put on a, a play, you know, with these elaborate costumes, teledog and telephant and these flowers. My mom was a flower and my, my dad was a, um, I don't know, a, like a kid in the play, whatever, all this stuff. And they would do these, these things to attract the kids, and the kids would eat it up. And they would learn about Jesus. And then we would have... Um, a prayer time and prayer circles and, and the parents would lead the kids to Jesus Christ thinking outside of the box, right? Those kids weren't going to be in church. Their parents didn't go to church, but if we could get the gospel to them, be praying, God, is there ways you can use me that is different? I'm hoping those online, you join us. Don't worry that you don't know anybody here. Join us on Zoom. Join us with this. We want to get to know you. It's going to be different what we're doing too because, again, we're not going to have someone preach and spoon feed us. We're going to be doing the work ourselves. We have to do the questions of the study guide. We've got to read the chapters. We've got to say, Holy Spirit, show me beyond just the words I'm reading, but show me in my life what you're doing. Show me the walls that need to be built up. We put that work in, and as we discuss together, I might learn something from you, and you might learn something from me. We be encouraged by one another. And we see that God, I, I'm, I'm an introvert. Is there any introverts out there? I'm an introvert, and sometimes I can't even express what's going on inside of me. It's hard for me. But when my wife is saying, what's on your heart? And I begin to open up and start talking, things start coming out that I didn't even realize. And truth starts coming in and healing starts coming. And she's able to, to give feedback and encouragement. And, and if we don't have that opportunity to do that with one another as brothers and sisters and encourage and build one another and help one another, then what are we here for? Just a social, just to say hi and gather? Are we here to, to iron, sharp, iron sharpens iron and build one another up, encourage one another, strengthen one another, pray for one another? We're all at different places. We're all going through different things. Nobody's worse than the other. Nobody's better than the other. We're all in this together. And God is allowing us to grow as a people of God, as a family of God, to say, I want to build those gardens up. I want to build those walls around. 
so that you're ready for what I'm going to do. Which takes us to the last thing here. Rising above mediocrity to a level of excellence takes the eyes of an eagle. Chuck Swindoll writes, at any given time, we are choosing to focus on one of four things, our circumstances, others, ourselves, or the Lord. When outnumbered, Gideon refused to focus on his circumstances. And when victorious against overwhelming odds, he refused to shine the spotlight on himself. Instead, he gave the glory to the Lord. An eagle's eyes are amazingly keen. On a clear day, an eagle can spot a dead fish floating on the surface of a lake five miles away. That's focus. If we're ever to win the battle over discouragement, we have to develop spiritual eyesight with similar clarity and concentration, even if we're the only bird in the flock to have it. I believe this is a season for us a season of focus, and a focus on our own lives. We all know we got to focus on others, right? But I believe God wants us to focus on getting our gardens, the weeds out, <laughs> the bad thinking, the bad way we do things, the, you know, oh, that's just the way I am. No, baloney, that's not the way God made you to be. You're in the image of God, we're trying to take that back, right? And it takes work. But focusing on ourselves for the season to restore the gardens, to build up the walls around us, so that we'll be able to help others to do the same. Right? It's like somebody coming in and, and our garden's all a mess and our walls are broken down around it. And they're like, man, I'm a mess, man. Can you help me with yours? Uh, sure. But we can't even make our own garden in our own walls, right? And we're trying to help somebody else out? It makes no sense, right? So God, I believe this is a season for us to say it's okay to focus on yourself right now because I'm getting you ready to bring people in. I'm getting you ready to go out and to see people who need their gardens refurbished and their walls rebuilt. And I'm, this season, focus on what I'm doing in you. Get ready. Build it up. And then I'm going to anoint you to go out and help others. God, we thank you for your holy word that challenges us to not live in mediocrity, to not live in status quo, but to live a life of excellence that you've called us. Surrendering our will to yours, knowing that you have a better plan for our lives. Rebuilding the walls of our minds, of our soul. Learning to know what is really true and what is not. The way we talk, the way we think, the way we act. All the things that we do. And when the enemy tries to come in, or our flesh, or others, or whatever, who try to bring negative thoughts or things that sound good, but they're not of you, that we will learn to say, nope, that's not God. I know the truth, and I'm walking confident in who he's made me to be. Christ is enthroned in my heart, and my garden is in bloom. The weeds are gone, and my wall is built up. God, only you can do that in our lives, and we ask that you would, but you are calling us to focus and to do the work. So God, we say yes, we will do that. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Be blessed and have an amazing Sunday.